Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Mirrorwood Center's program with Dale Sharon. Uh, for those of you who do not know, this is the Mirrorwood Center. This is, uh, and Dale is a 25 year docent for the St. Louis Art Museum. Today, she's going to take a look at the history of money through the lens of related paintings and objects in the permanent collection at the Art Museum. And also, I wanted to mention that Dale will have a new series beginning on June the 28th, which will be Jewish Touchpoint at the St. Louis Art Museum. So please welcome Dale Sharon today. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to see everyone. Um, welcome back. And uh, thank you again for joining us. I hope you're all well and staying safe and enjoying, enjoying your masklessness. Um, I don't know if that's really a word, but um, at any rate, it's, it's really great to see you all again. Um, the images that from the St. Louis Art Museum's permanent collection that we'll see today all in one way or another will relate to money and art. Now, bear with me because money and art is an interesting combination. Um, and by the way, there are many trivia facts that you will be able to use if you're ever on Jeopardy. So <laughs> the plan today is to look at masterworks from the St. Louis Art Museum that connect with and link to the history of money and banks and the display of wealth, um, or as we might say, currency, craftsmanship, and class. So my husband, uh, who likes puns, suggested that after the presentation, I hope you might say it all makes sense. <laughs> sense. Okay. Um, and he wondered if the official nut of the banks was the cashew. <laughs> or if the, thanks for laughing. <laughs> or if the theft of a work of art might be called a withdrawal. Draw with their okay. Enough of that. Um, let's begin. So, here's an obvious question How did money as we know it develop, and how did we go from barter to banknotes? Well, money, in some way, shape, or form, has been part of human history for thousands of years. Um, early human beings had no system of money as we know it, and they certainly didn't have Bitcoin. But to get things they wanted, people used the barter system of trading. Now, from the time the primeval fires of mankind were kindled, bartering was used as a direct trade for goods and services, just like in this cartoon. So, for example, a farmer may exchange a bushel of wheat for a goat. Now, bartering frequently consisted of objects that failed to do the trick. For example, animals were not conveniently divisible for making minor payments. It was really hard to make change. Barter, barter was also unsuitable, unsuitable for financing armies or levying taxes, so the system had to adapt. And gradually, people learned that almost everyone would accept certain specific goods in exchange for a product or service. And the following are examples of some of these specific goods or what we might call commodity money from the St. Louis Art Museum's permanent collection. Items such as feathers, scarce me precious metals, shells, beads, yams, beans, animal skin, salt, all have been used in different societies as a medium of exchange or as what we might call commodity money. The system of trading is spread across the world and it still survives today in some parts of the globe. These rolls were used as money and they were made from hundreds of cardinals and pigeon feathers. They were made in the, South, in the um, Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. And they were used as a medium of exchange during transactions such as marriage, purchase of pigs, and payment for labor. The coil usually extended about 30 feet, 
and the pieces could be cut off in partial payments. They were stored in rafters to avoid um, fading and insect infestations because the value depreciated as the scarlet color of the cardinal feathers faded. Now these rules were practical as well as beautiful. And my husband says they would be great for wraparound financing, whatever wraparound financing is. I'm not very sure about that. Let's move on to the kind of shell from Papua New Guinea. These large gold-lipped pearl shells were called kina shells or kina shells, and they were used in the western parts of the southern highlands in the Papua New Guinea as an exchange medium. They were also used as objects of personal adornment, like you see here. Before Westerners arrived in the highlands in 1933, the raw shells were traded from, from the coast for hundreds and hundreds of miles. These shells were very rare and very expensive. And so use as a necklace, as you see here, was definitely a measure of status and prestige. Cowrie shells are known as the most successful and best form of currency in various regions of the world. In Western Africa, shell money was the usual legal tender up until the mid 19th century. In many African countries, the shells were fast, fastened together in strings so that 50 or 20 strings represented a dollar. Shells have also historically been used extensively in jewelry. They've been also used for decorative as well as ceremonial purposes, like you see here in this shrine object. 14 multiple strands of cowrie shells uh, were used as money in this region of Ni Nigeria. And they're strung on this shrine object, which is dedicated to the deity Eshu. Eshu represents uncertainty and unpredictability in the universe. And for that reason, he must be placated through periodic sacrifice or offerings. According to African legend, cowrie shells also represent the goddess of protection and are connected to the strength and the energy of the ocean. Since cowrie shells are also commonly used as currency in various parts of Africa, they're also recognized as a symbol of prosperity. This is a very interesting story. Um, many Northwest Coast Native Americans made items like this, which is called a copper. As representations of immense wealth, coppers appeared in, in elaborate performances as, at feasts. Copper circulated between rivals and allies and their value increased as they changed hands. Now the copper was a mainstay of a festival called the Potlatch Festival, where ceremony distribution of property and gifts affirmed or reaffirmed social status. So a potlatch involves giving away or destroying wealth or valuable objects in order to demonstrate a leader's wealth or power. So a potlatch is characterized by an unusual ceremony in which possessions like this copper are given away or destroyed. This was meant to display wealth, generosity, and enhance prestige. A copper could be transferred to another in exchange for fishing village rights or, um, or might be valued for as much as 16,000 blankets. Now at these festivals, a family or hereditary leader holds a feast for their guests. The main purpose of the potlatch is the redistribution and the reciprocity of wealth. A potlatch is not just a party, it's a really big deal. And planning for the potlatch might take an entire year or even more. Potlatches were not only given for big events, they were given for everything. There were vengeance potlatches and humiliation potlatches, as well as celebratory and memorial potlatches. And many would feature objects like this copper. This vessel from the Mayan world was used to hold hot cocoa. Now, cocoa beans were used as a source of money, as a medium of exchange in the Mayan world. 
And so they were used as drink only by the aristocracy and royalty. I mean, having a cup of cocoa would have been like eating a hundred dollar bill today. This outstanding vessel depicts the ritual ball game ubiquitous in the pre-Columbian world. Here, however, the hot and hot cocoa refers to spicy, not temperature. The drink was a mixture of cocoa beans and hot peppers. Doesn't it sound just disgusting? I know, that sounds good to me. So eventually the monetary system evolved from commodity money like we've just seen to coins, cash, and currency. So let's see how that happened. Ritual bronze vessels were symbols of wealth and importance in the Shang dynasty in ancient China. The perfection of ancient bronze making is epitomized in this elaborate wine vessel. The king would give a loyal officer payment for service, such as cowrie shells, which we mentioned before. And then the officer would commission the making of this vessel in honor of his revered ancestor. But sometime around 770 BC, the Chinese moved from using actual usable objects such as tools or weapons as a medium of exchange to using miniature replicas of these same objects that had been cast in bronze, similar to the small knife that you see here. Due to impracticality, I mean, nobody wants to reach in their pocket and impale their hand on a sharp arrow or knife. Um, these tiny bronzes were abandoned for objects in the shape of a circle. And so these bronze objects then became kind of like the first coins. There's some debate regarding where the world's first true coin actually came from, but most experts agree that the appearance of the first coins as we know them were in present day Turkey. At some point in 650 BC, coins became the standard currency for trade. Through coinage, trade was able to be conducted over vast distances between various different countries. Ancient coins such as these from our collection were more than just money in the times they circulated. They were also considered pieces of art. Now, Slam has a huge collection of ancient coins. And if you're interested in seeing them magnified and seeing the details on each one, there is a high tech display in the hallway next to the Egyptian galleries um, on the third floor. And I think you might find that to be um, pretty interesting. Ancient coins tell the story of early civilizations through the Egyptian, Greek, and Roman empires, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance. If ancient coins could talk, what a story they would tell from the people who designed and minted them to the many hands these ancient coins must have passed through. Now, no other image at the St. Louis Art Museum shows coins being used in such an interesting way. Artemisia Genelewski may have been only 19 years old when she painted this exquisite image of Danai. The mythological story unfolds as Danai's father was told by an oracle that his daughter's offspring would destroy him. So he locked her in a chamber impenetrable to potential suitors. So she couldn't have children. I mean, what else would you do? The god Zeus fell in love with beautiful Danai and undeterred, transformed himself into a shower of golden coins and impregnated Danai. So here you can see the coins right there. She eventually gave birth, birth to Perseus, who went on to have many, many heroic adventures, such as killing Medusa. One day, Perseus was in a competition and threw a javelin, which hit an old man by mistake. Of course, it was his grandfather. The oracle was right. An old saying goes, you don't want to be on the receiving end of a javelin throw. This very early work shows Artemisia's accomplished handling of the female nude, as well as her brilliant depiction of textures and textiles. You can feel the velvet in, in the linens. It, and incredibly, it's painted on copper, 
Most artists would never attempt that. What an amazing talent and what an unusual use of coins. Usage of paper notes dates back to the seventh century in Tang Dynasty, China, where trade on the Silk Road was paramount. So let's talk a little bit about the Silk Road. The 4,000 mile Silk Road included a large network of strategically located trading posts designed to streamline the transport and exchange of goods from the Far East to the Middle East to Europe. Few persons traveled the entire route and goods were handled in a staggered progression by middlemen. Trade along the Silk Road included almost everything, fruits and vegetables, livestock, grain, leather and hides and tools and religious objects and artwork and precious stones and metals and paper and weapons and on and on and on. The Tang Dynasty camel is a reminder of the wealth and riches of the Silk Road. The ceramic two-humped Bactrian and camel was likely part of a set of objects placed in the tomb of an important merchant to signify his wealth and position in society. The camel was essential, if not critical to successful trade and commerce on the Silk Road, adapted to the harsh desert conditions of Central Asia and the Middle East. The camels made ideal pack animals for travel along the Silk Road. They thrived on tough desert plants. They could carry as much as 300 pounds and they didn't need very much water. Horses as well as camels were key to the development of international trade on the, on the Silk Road. The horse in ancient China has always been a symbol of national vitality and a, and, and a symbol of, of national strength. This Tang Dynasty horse and rider would have also been found in a tomb and is typical of the three color glazes of the Tang Dynasty. The horse culture, which has a long history in China, played an irreplaceable role in the Silk Road transportation. Now for centuries, copper coins had been China's primary currency. In order to carry large amounts of cash though, people hefted around an ever increasingly number of these heavy coins, not the easiest or safest thing to do over long distances. In an attempt to lighten their load, merchants on the Silk Road began to deposit these coins with each other and they were issued paper certificates for the coins value. The paper was certainly lighter, so light in fact that it's believed to have had a nickname called flying money for its tendency to kind of blow away in the silk wind, in the uh, stiff wind. The use of this type of paper money remained in place for the next 200 years until merchants and the Tang Dynasty, Song Dynasty government officials issued and accepted paper notes backed by gold reserves, the first legal tender in the world. So these lighter and safer paper notes were carried around in place of metal coins. The paper money could be used to buy goods and services and in this way operated much like currency does today in the modern world. However, it was issued by banks and private institutions, not by the government, which is now responsible for issuing currency in most countries. So how do we go from shells and feathers to a drive-through bank on every corner and MasterCard in every wallet? Well, money lending is as old as civilization. And so is our attitude toward money lenders and bankers, as you see here. Ancient writers often reference bankers and money lenders and money changers in a very negative way. The subject of this print concerns a story told in the New Testament in which Jesus came upon merchants and money lenders De defying the temple with their commerce, declaring the temple a place of prayer, he forcefully demanded their departure. Rembrandt was a master printmaker, perhaps the best of all time. Like he was the best of all time. His printmaking reflects his interest in innovation and experimentation. By the 1650s, Rembrandt began to treat the printing plate much like a canvas, leaving 
some ink or tone on the surface of the plate in order to create a painted impression of a different print in which each impression would look different depending on the way he inked the plate. Rembrandt added emotional and psychological depth to his subjects through expressive faces, dramatic body language, and his use of bold shadow and light, as you can just see all of that when you just, it's the detail is incredible. Rembrandt was fascinated with subjects from the Old and New Testament. And as in this print, he enjoyed revealing the narrative detail inspired by many changers. The beginning of modern banking is usually placed in the year 1587, when the Banco di Rialto was established in Venice, Italy. This makes sense because Venice was a sort of um, polyglot of commerce and culture. Country after country found itself trading and doing business in Venice in the 16th and 17th centuries. The sculpture was made in Venice around that time. Venice, in, Venice welcomed all religions and ethnicities. And this sculpture emphasizes just that fact. It's a portrait of a Moor sculpted by a German in Venice, Italy. And you can't get much more global than that. This portrait of an unknown man stands as one of the most dignified representations of black Africans from 17th century Europe. It's the only secular work known to have been sculpted by Bartel. The bust exemplifies the artist's mastery of carving and the contrasting color of the, of the uh, different marble is just unique. Bartel's greatest achievement was the completion of the Venetian tomb of the Doge. This is the tomb over here. Um, and Doge is the term for the head of state for various uh, several Italian city-states during the, me the medieval and Renaissance periods. The tomb included colossal figures of muscular Moors who stood like mythical atlases with the weight of the upper tomb on their, so on their shoulders. Bust of a Black Man records one of the models who posed for this project. And you can see the Moors down here. And this is the, uh, our, our model right there. He does not hold himself as a slave, which I think we, we might think that he probably was a slave on, first, um, on, on our first impression, but he isn't dressed as one, nor does he hold himself as one. Instead, he has the bearing and appearance of a merchant or, or a trader. Our term banking comes from the word banco, meaning bench, because early Italian bankers carried on their business at a bench in the street. Now, many Italian cities established banks, and eventually, by the 16th century, banking began to spread throughout Europe and into France. Painter to King Francis I, Jean Clouet, played a key role in establishing the Renaissance portrait tradition in France, like you see here. Now, this painting is titled Portrait of a Banker. The banker holds a quill pen in one hand, and in the other, French gold coins that, we, that are called accus. Um, that may be a familiar term to any of you who do crossword puzzles, um, because it's always a clue. Um, the sitter of this French portrait has, has been identified as a banker, although no specific name has been discovered. However, the amount of jewelry that he wears and the expensive clothing indicate a person of some wealth and status. And the coins illustrate the importance of banking in 16th century Europe. In 1609, the Amsterdam Exchange Bank was founded which made Amsterdam the financial center of the world until the Industrial Revolution. In the late 17th century, one of the largest centers for commerce was the port of Amsterdam. Individuals could participate in the lucrative East India trade by purchasing bills of credit from Dutch banks located there. This is an image of a Dutch account keeper with a map on the wall showing Holland as the financial and trading center of the world. Throughout the 1650s, 
Nicholas Meiss explored themes of domestic life, including the sleeping woman. This image is not typical, however, for his dozing females are usually young. And symbolism here isn't clear. She may simply be a recent widow struggling to balance her household accounts, or she may be his lazy mother-in-law who he used often as his model. Modern Western economic and financial history is usually traced back to the coffee houses of London. Coffee houses. As my husband suggested, this may be the origin of the name Starbucks. Okay. At any rate, it was certainly the place where the chatter and classes met to conduct business gossip, exchange ideas, and debate the news of the day. No alcohol was served and women were excluded. Each coffee house had a particular clientele, usually defined by occupation, interest, or attitudes, such as Tories and Whigs, traders and merchants, poets and authors, and businessmen and bankers. London coffee houses became known as penny universities, because that was the price of admission and a cup of coffee. Here is a picture of one of these rather elegant coffee houses. You can see they have nice pictures on the wall and everyone's dressed to the nines. It doesn't look like a, a tavern at all. Several great British institutions can trace their roots back to these humble coffee houses. This is really interesting. The London Stock Exchange had its beginning in Jonathan's Coffee House in 1698, where gentlemen met to set, stock, to set stock and commodity prices. Auctions in sales rooms attached to, to coffee houses were the beginnings of the great coffee houses of Sotheby's and Christie's. Lloyd's of London had its origins in Lloyd's Coffee House where merchants and shippers and underwriters um, met to do business. Here, John Julius Angerstein, the subject of the painting, began the company that insured Marilyn Monroe's legs. This is John Julius. So jo Joshua Reynolds, the artist, set the standard for 18th century portraiture. He was the founder of the Royal Academy in London in 1769. And he was an innovator who expanded the portrait to more than just mere face painting. He was a painter to the rich and famous and one of the wealthiest painters of his time. So John Julius Agerstein became a successful banker and an astute connoisseur of art. His collection of 38 paintings were sold, was sold to the English government in 1824 and became the nucleus of the celebrated National Gallery of London. And it all began in a coffee house. Um, here's an, a Jeopardy fact for you. The word tips comes from these early English coffee houses. It means to ensure prompt service, tips to ensure prompt service. You put money into a cup before you were served in order to get a good table and have prompt service. The opposite of the way we use it today. Meanwhile, in America, growth of banking in the United States in colonies was very slow. Paper currency was seldom used and England did not furnish coins to the colonists and forbade the colonists to make their own. So the colonists used any foreign coins they could get their hands on. The most common coins were from Spain, represented by this elaborate silver Spanish cross. The image illustrates the beauty and superior craftsmanship of Spanish silversmiths and the wealth of Spain. The colonists mainly used large Spanish silver dollars called pieces of eight, like right here. To make change, a person would chop the coin into eight pie-shaped pieces called bits. So two bits were worth a quarter of a dollar and so on. Today, two bits still is used to mean a quarter of a dollar. I think that's kind of cool. Diverse theories link the origin of the dollar sign to the columns and stripes that appear on the side of the Spanish dollar. 
So here is the back of a Spanish dollar. And here you see this column. This is a blow up of that. Um, so you can see the column with a banner that's going around it. And it, it does look like a dollar sign if, if you, you know, when you, when you look at it. So that, that's what they, what they think was the origin of, the, of this symbol. The goldsmiths who made articles out of gold and silver had vaults where they kept the metals. And many people began to bring their money to the goldsmiths to keep in their vaults. The um, goldsmiths issued receipts or notes for these and they were much easier to carry around than coins and people accepted them um, as the money. The colonists used a variety of goods in place of money. Often their money was put into silver and gold objects like this coffee pot. So the value of a silver tureen or a coffee pot was not just decorative, not just useful, but had its intrinsic value as well. Silver displayed the wealth and social standing of its owners. It was the earliest art form to develop in the colonies. This coffee pot by Meyer Myers is as good as it gets in American silver. He's considered a master, a Dutch immigrant who became the first Jewish silversmith in New York and even became president of the Silversmiths Guild. He produced many secular pieces such as this coffee pot, as well as liturgical elements for both churches and synagogues. Like Paul Revere, he was a patriot active in the cause of independence, melting lead items into bullets for the army. His mark is a double stamping of his last name overlapping the S in Myers. Of course, no talk of money and colonial America would be complete without referencing Ben Franklin. This sculpture of, by Hiram Powers was considered one of the best likenesses of Franklin anywhere. His words of wisdom still ring true today. A penny saved is a penny earned, and time is money, and rather go to bed without dinner than to rise in debt. And wealth is not his that has it, but his that enjoys it. And of course, we see his image on the $100 bill today. Hiram Powers was the first 19th century American artist to gain an international reputation. And this bust of Ben Franklin is considered in the forefront of American portrait sculpture. Paul Revere played a key role in the creation of early American currency. Revere famed for his 1775 midnight ride to warn American colonists of the impeding British invasion was actually far more famous in his day for his work as an engraver and is one of the colony's premier silversmiths. Revere was a splendid artisan with an eye for elegant design, as you see here. Just months after his exploits near Concord, it was Revere who was tasked with designing the engraving plates for the first continental currency produced by Massachusetts to fund the war. By the end of the American Revolution, these paper notes had become worthless. And one of the first projects undertaken by the US government following the ratification of the constitution was the passage of the Coinage Act, establishing the US Mint and regulating coin production. The first regularly circulating coins in American history were delivered in March, 1793 and made of rolled copper provided in part by Paul Revere. The sunset depicted so dramatically in this painting by Bricker was painted at the close of the Civil War. Such, as, such a vivid representation of the end of the day referenced the profound drama, trauma and drama the Americans had endured in the war. Simultaneously, the grandeur of the scene also spoke to American optimism about the future. But at the time this painting was made, counterfeiting in the United States was rampant. Now, money tampering has been around nearly as long as money itself has existed. Early coins were shaved around the edges with the perpetrator pocketing the excess um, materials in their pocket. 
um, Rome, among other ancient civilizations, made counterfeiting a crime punishable by death. Curiously, in, place, in the place where modern American bills say, in God we trust, the Chinese inscription at the time warned, those who are counterfeiting will be de decapitated. Counterfeiting reached its apex during the American Civil War with dozens with dozens and dozens of different notes and coins being issued by state, local, and federal governments on both sides, it was nearly impossible to detect the real from the fake. It's been estimated that at least one third, probably more like one half, of all the money then in circulation was fraudulent. The term greenback, which is now a common term for money, traces its origin to the Civil War. The phrase was derived from the intricate green ink designs on the reverse side of the Civil War banknotes. And you can see that here. And because the government thought that it would um, prevent counterfeiting. Here's um, kind of another interesting fact. The US Secret Service was created in 1865 when this painting was made, not to protect the president, but to combat counterfeiting. The first successful banks in the United States were in Philadelphia, Boston, and New York at the end of the 18th century. But street commerce was common until the 20th century. George Lukes, known for his confident brushwork and colorful palette, walked the streets of lower Manhattan where he found subjects for his paintings in street vendors. Lukes was a member of the Ashcan School, a loosely affiliated group of rebellious artists who were preoccupied with the depiction of modern city life. This painting captures the teeming energy of New York's street commerce with its push cart peddlers filling the foreground of Luke's crowded carnival. A lot of business was continued, continued to be conducted this way. Today, I can't imagine life without a credit card. Um, it's a fixture in my overstuffed wallet. Slowly but surely, we are becoming a cashless society. Today's credit card first showed up in 1950 when Diners Club is credited with issuing the first card. But did you know that medieval merchants developed an early version of the credit card that lasted until the 19th century? Medieval merchants, I mean, this is really cool. In an era when currency was often unavailable and few people were literate, the tally stick, which you see here, a forerunner of today's high-tech credit cards became increasingly popular in Europe. In this early version of financial record keeping, notches were made on a wooden stick to indicate the amount lent and owed, like a, like a debit or a credit card. The sticks were then split down the middle the creditor kept one half and the debtor the other. When a payment was made, the sticks were paired up and the payment was marked on the stick. The tally stick system also had another built-in benefit. It was nearly impossible to counterfeit as the shape, size, and grain of the wooden halves had to match up perfectly. Tally sticks were used in much of Europe but probably nowhere as extensively as in England. This painting by Gainsborough is typical of the type of location where tally sticks were used. They were used in small villages and towns throughout, um, throughout England. Gainsborough loved painting landscapes, although his bread and butter was portraiture. Um, I don't know if you remember those those portraits um, that were on playing cards of blue boy and pink lady when we were kids, but um, those were made by, by Gainsborough. For more than 700 years, tally sticks were used to collect taxes from local citizens until the system was finally abandoned in 1826. When the British Parliament finally decided to get rid of the thousands of leftover tally sticks being kept in storage, they decided to burn them in an underground furnace that heated the House of Lords resulting in the worst fire to hit London since the Great Fire of 1666. 
Without other objects to reference for scale, it's impossible to know whether this rock is a tiny pebble or a massive boulder or maybe even a planet. Rene Magritte, the artist, was a prominent member of the Surrealist movement who painted disorienting and dreamlike subjects in a very realistic style like this. But his work was always difficult to interpret, difficult to understand. And in that same vein, who really understands Bitcoin? Is this the new direction of our financial world today? Or is it a fantasy, a dream like surrealism? Surrealists sought to reject a rational vision of life and explore the unconscious mind as a way of creating art resulting in dreamlike, sometimes bizarre imagery. At its basic, the imagery is certainly unconventional and almost always perplexing. And I don't know about you, but to me, cryptocurrency is as perplexing as surrealism. And yet both are a reaction against the norm and both mean to jolt us out of our common rules and boundaries. And today, both are worth a pretty penny. Show me the money. You might all remember this line that was spoken by Cuba Gooding Jr. in the film Jerry Maguire um, starring Tom Cruise. Well, the portraits in this section echo that sentiment. It's all about the money. Many of our paintings depict wealthy, moneyed and affluent subjects each reference status and prestige and pos position in society. First of all, only the wealthy could afford to have their painted at all. And to have your portrait painted by the most famous painters of their time, such as Holbein or Copley or Rubens was another indication of wealth. So let's look at a few. I have to begin with the most well-known of our Renaissance portraits. Henry Guildford was comptroller under Hen King Henry VIII. The splendid portrait of his wife, Mary, is among the most impressive of Hans Holbein's English paintings. Holbein was a painter to the court of Henry VIII, and he even vetted the brides of Henry with his drawings. This portrait is one of a pair that presented a wealthy and important husband and wife. His portrait still hangs in Windsor Castle hung with gold chains and embellished with pearls, wearing furs in the latest jeweled headdress, Lady Guildford embodies worldly prosperity. The jewels were designed by Holbein himself. Lady Guildford is the picture of wealth. And with her prayer book, she's also the very image of propriety. The background ivy may have been intended as an emblem of steadfastness and faithfulness, the good wife, and the column may present a cultured and educated woman. We might recognize that all of these portraits are of royalty, perhaps not their identity, but certainly their royal status, because each holds or wears a symbol of their authority, power, and wealth. King Charles I of England who reigned from 1625 to 49, presents an image of royal majesty, wearing his coronation robes and surrounded by symbols of his rule, a golden orb, a jeweled crown and a scepter. The artist Daniel Mytens was probably the most famous artist during his lifetime that you've never heard of. The king's right arm perched on his hip and threshed forward suggests an assertive ruler. And this trait would have brought King Charles I into conflict with Parliament, leading to civil war in his execution. So that's Charles I. The miniature painting over here, this is really a small, small little painting, um, depicts Emperor Shah Jahan from 1592 to 1666 in formal court attire. He holds a rose, the royal Mughal symbol representing sovereignty, power, and authority of the dynasty. The emperor was self-conscious about his image and strictly controlled all portraits made of him. Artists were required to depict him only in profile as no one should look upon his full countenance. 
And thirdly, we have King Francis I of France, who ruled France from 1515 to 1547. He wears 16th century French court costume in this portrait. His costume and his jewels reflect royal wealth. In his left hand, he holds the bejeweled gold pommel of his sword, a symbol of his authority. Embedded with materials exclusive to royalty, this sculpture served as an idealized portrait of a past Benin Oba or king. The use of highly valuable bronze in the depiction of precious coral beads that nearly consume the Oba space convey great power and luxury. Only the king was allowed to wear the 22 strands of coral beads that you see here. The portrait head was placed on a royal altar and also served as a pedestal for a carved ivory tusk, another costly substance that only the Oba could access. And the tusk would have fit up here. There's a, there's a hole in the top of his head. Upon installation as king, an Oba would commission a bronze head such as this to honor his predecessor to maintain the bonds of royal communication with his ancestors. These next two portraits illustrate the wealth of the Dutch Golden Age. The first portrait on the left was by Franz Hals when sober and elegant portraits were favored by the wealthy citizens of Holland. That's where he painted for the most, most of his life. This portrait presents the very essence of a respected, wealthy 17th century Dutch woman. Her clothing shouts wealth. Black was the most expensive dye and probably derived from the Spanish court or church. Cloth itself was expensive and the voluminous dress reflects luxury. The textile on the upholstered chair would have cost more than a carved wood frame. The clothing of the woman on the right is more elaborate with sumptuous gold embroidery, fine lace cap and ruffled collar. And the lace cost about a year's salary for an average worker. All of these were signs of her family's prosperity. These next two portraits show the much more opulent figures of the French court. Portraits of the 17th and 18th century French court were some of the most luxuriant and grandiose in Europe. During the reign of Louis XIV, where court attendants vied to be present during the king's morning toilette, images set in the bedroom or boudoir were appropriate for the display of wealth and power. Women did business in the boudoir, not that kind of business. This woman on the left, whose identity remains unknown, presents herself amid objects and dress that enhance her beauty and define her taste and status. The luxurious beads in her hair and the delicate satins and substantial laces of her gown were particularly popular during, uh, among the money society. The gilt furniture, the pearls, the imported Chinese vase, all affirm her affluence and position of the French court. The clothing of the woman on the right is much more subtle and soft, but again, the fabric and fashionable style of dress as well as the garlands of flowers are typical of the affluent French woman. Natier was a popular artist for the court known for his Rococo style of portraiture. This exquisite ensemble indicates the sitter was a woman of wealth and importance. Gold discs decorate the edge of her collar, while rubies and emeralds adorn her hair. She wears an extravagant necklace with a large cut diamond and luxurious pearl. X-rays show that her hand was repainted and moved down in the composition to make room for the incredible necklace and pendant. This was definitely meant to show the money. It's a representation of Camilla Martelli, mistress and then second wife of the Grand Duke of Tuscany, Cosimo de' Medici I. After the death of Cosimo's first wife, Camilla became Cosimo's lover, despite being 26 years his junior. Camilla did not agree with her. Um, Camilla was actually the main focus of, of bitter arguments between Cosimo and his children. 
they do not agree with her appetite for a stenchous luxury, which we can definitely see in this painting. And to make matters worse, she was spending their money. After his death, Camillo was forced to retire to a Florentine convent. These military leaders represent figures of authority, images of leadership, wealth, and military expertise. Ambrosio Spinola was a Genoese military officer who commanded the Spanish army in the Netherlands. The original of this portrait was painted in the 17th century by Peter Paul Rubens. On the request of the sitter, two copies were made. They were probably made by Rubens in his studio, each for one of his estates. Um, I mean, everyone needs a life-size portrait of themselves in each of their homes. Here, the Marquis is dressed in a very, very, very expensive parade armor. The sleeves are stuffed with fabric or hay so that he looks muscular. The costume makes him look quite important with the formal rough feathered hat and gauntlet. The red scarf is a badge or identification of his battalion, all a symbol of his status, his wealth, and his prominence. Finally detailed uh, with great attention to each Lincoln chain and gold adornment on the cap, this next portrait presents one of the most famous 16th century leaders of the French army. The golden lace and his self-assurance present a strong and important military leader. De Coligny went on to become active in French Huguenot causes and his 1572 assassination was both tragic and brutal. Now these suits of armor were made for knights, for the wealthy. It's not quite a portrait, but it's an indication of one's place in society and one's great wealth. These suits of armor were extremely expensive in their time, costing as much as a Mercedes or, or even in some cases a small jet. They were so important that metalsmiths were, smet, were sent to battle along with the soldiers to repair any battle damage that might occur. They were designed to reflect the fashion of their time and our suit of armor reflects the style of the court of Henry VIII. It was named after Maximilian, the Holy Roman Emperor who made armor fashionable. The emperor cultivated a chivalrous heroic image straight out of Camelot. His preferred power flex came in armor. Maximilian owned so many weapons in suits of metal that he purchased an entire home just to fill it with his armored bounty. I wanted to talk a minute about John Singleton Copley, who was the premier artist in the colonies. His portrait of Barry, of Henry Barry, is a fine example of American taste. Copley was a genius and his colonial portraits were known for their extraordinary vitality and penetrating realism. Not as opulent or as detailed and sophisticated as his English portraits. And yet this painting shows Barry as a patriot, patriotic American with his hand over his heart wearing his military uniform. He's painted as one of the colony's elite. When Copley moved to England, his style changed and became much more meticulous and filled with details that weren't found in his colonial portraits like Barry. Henry Addington over here, his authoritative pose and commanding garments are an affirmation of his wealth and social position, but much more detailed and filled with elaborate background clues to his status. He entered Parliament in 1783 and served as Speaker of the House of Commons. The rich velvet robes with refined gold trim are those of his office. Addington's elevated status is underscored through the mace and view of Parliament. The gilt table and satin fabric and classic columns speak to his wealth. This is quite different from the landscape in the background of Henry Barry.
through the elegance of these costumes and the forthright and assertive poses of these subjects, we can easily discern three portraits of the European elite. On the left, the elaborately decorated sword band, the, elaborate, the embroidered shirt, and the finely made satin lining of the cuffs show off the sitter's wealth and, and taste. De Graaf's family was part of the governing privileged class of Amsterdam, and all of his family were extremely rich. The portrait certainly demonstrates that fact. Its textures and details are just magnificent. In the middle, Lords John Stuart and Bernard Stuart died fighting for the Royalists against the parliamentarians during the English Civil War from 1642 to 51. Their sumptuously detailed dress, fabrics, the fabrics and footwell are prerogatives of the wealthy. Slashing, which is cutting the outer layer of cloth to reveal an inner layer of contrasting color and fabric, became popular in both men and women's fashions. It was said to be a reference to the wounds that a soldier might have received in battle. They're also holding gloves, which is a symbol of nobility. This third portrait is a wow. The lace and sheen and texture and realism of these garments are just breathtaking. The sumptuous fabric of his cape and impressive lace of his longer tunic are focal points of this powerful portrait. A ribbon holds a medal of the Order of Saint Esprit. The clock and inkstand and book refer to the Cardinal's official duties. All are intended to indicate the influential and distinguish basis of his elevated position. Children's portraits are also a symbol of status and position of society. So of course, with this last portrait, we are looking at one of the best portrait artists in history with this painting by John Singer Sargent. During this period, conveying one's social position with a portrait by John Singer Sargent became a mode to set the wealthy apart. Sargent was an American expatriate artist considered the leading portrait artist of his generation for his paintings of Gilded Age luxury. He created roughly 900 oil paintings and more than 2000 watercolors, as well as countless sketches and charcoal drawings. As for Charlotte Cram, the little girl, she was from a wealthy Massachusetts family, raised on an estate in upstate New York. The estate was later owned by designer Ralph Lauren, so it couldn't have been too shabby. Charlotte's portrait characterizes the best of Sargent's work, as well as the affluence of her family. So today we've seen a number of images that focus on portraiture and wealthy or moneyed individuals and through the lens of history and money, we have seen some amazing masterworks. Money runs through the museum in the art world. In fact, this is an amazing figure. The art market today is estimated at over $70 billion, in itself a multi-billion dollar enterprise. One thing my husband didn't say, we can certainly bank on seeing incredible works of art in the St. Louis Art Museum. And I hope you'll be able to visit them in person in the galleries soon. Thanks again, stay safe. And we'll see you next time as we begin our journey through touch points of Jewish art in the St. Louis Art Museum. So thanks again for joining us. And does, if anyone has any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Should I get out? Let's yeah, put this. Yeah, go ahead and stop share. Stop share. Or where do we, there we go. Okay. There we go. Now we can see everyone. <laughs> okay. So anyone have any questions or anything? Comments, questions? You're all set to go Linda, on. Linda has, Linda, go ahead. First of all, Dale, thank you so much. That was a really interesting and informative presentation. Uh, many of those pieces that you showed are favorites of mine at the Art Museum. Oh, good, good.
And I am already exposed to Barry's humor often. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, me too. <laughs> he is uh, a pleasure though. So yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed this and thank you again for the presentation. Oh, good, thanks. Um, I have to kind of rein him in, I think. <laughs> because he can, he can, he does I don't know how his mind works it's a little <laughs> a little weird actually <laughs> um so we had a couple of comments here uh, Al said fabulous presentation as always Dale you do an amazing job of informing us in art and then Diane says wonderful presentation as always as well so anyone have any other questions today I well, I hope you all will join us for the next series um, about um, Judea, Jewish art in and in, in this with looking at art at the St. Louis Art Museum. It's really amazing to me that I could find that so many pieces lent itself to the topic, and um, I think I think you probably will enjoy it. Um, I think I've probably learned more um, about Bible stories than. I knew, be well, I know I did, that I knew before. So <laughs> um, I hope, I hope you all will, um, will join us because it's, um, it should, it should be interesting. Dale, I'm just going to say it's so fun. I think it's so fun that you are enjoying research as much as you are enjoying presenting it to us. And we thank you for that. Because <laughs> you're well, sharing can... your enjoyment with us. If I could remember any of it, it would be great. But <laughs> Which is, I think, what's happening as we get to be our age, right? <laughs> I think Al had a question. Did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I, well, I think you answered it. Dale, do you uh, research and make these presentations yourself? If you do, they're amazing. Yes, yeah. Right, that you just, you know, think of a topic and, you know, walk through the museum and kind of find what, what really resonates and, and works with the topic. Right and hopefully resonates with everyone as well as with me, so. Absolutely. Martin makes a comment, Martin Weiss, thanks for putting your money where your mouth is. Uh. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks. thanks for us. Oh. <laughs> it was better than anything my husband said. Does anybody know what wraparound financing is? <laughs> I don't. So, <laughs> it sounded good though. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Dale, so much again for your wonderful presentation. And we are looking forward to your fabulous next research project of the Jewish art in the art museum. So, and that will be June the 28th. So please join us again for that particular um, program. Actually, it will be a two-part series, I think. Isn't no, that four correct? Part. Four, four part. part. I'm sorry. Four part series. There's so much information we can't fit it in. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> so thank you everyone and we'll thank see you. Thank you all. Time. Enjoy the nice weather. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.